guess we better get started. So hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Keisha. My pronouns are she, her. I am a guest curator at the Penticton Art Gallery um, for the exhibition called Living While Marginalized. We are hosting this panel on the unceded traditional silks territory, also known as the Okanagan in so-called Canada. I encourage everyone tuning in today to take a moment and donate to a local Indigenous organization if possible. You can visit thefriendshipcenter.ca to find ways to support. I'd also like to start today uh, just by thanking the BC Arts Council and the province of BC and the city of Penticton for sponsoring this exhibition and the programming that goes with it. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about the exhibition itself and then we can get started. So Living While Marginalized features 16 artists, um, all of whom are LGBTQ plus or Black Indigenous people of color, and most of them are both, which is fantastic. So everybody's contributed um, one or multiple pieces to this exhibition, and it kind of highlights some of our experiences as marginalized individuals living in Canada. Um, so marginalization, just so we're all on the same page, is when an individual or a group is put into a position of lesser power or isolation within society because of discrimination. So we see this happening um, in, we see the impacts of marginalization in housing, we see it in the job, in job industries, um, we see it even just at the beginning when we're, when people are putting in applications and there's discrimination because of name, um, so people are passed. We see it when positions in jobs are given to people, um, given to other people because maybe, you know, uh, so maybe your sexuality or gender identity um, isn't the status quo. Uh, so we see it kind of in this whole realm of ways and in our systems in Canada. Um, and we see it kind of in every level of government as well. So we see this long term lasting impact of marginalization. Uh, we see it with the poverty and wealth dis disparity. Uh, we see it with health challenges of individuals and communities, both physically and mentally. We see it um, in terms of harassment and hate crimes, the list kind of goes on. So living while marginalized kind of takes the idea of um, how art's always been kind of a revolutionary thing. It's always been something um, that's been driven by rebellion and revolution. And we kind of embrace that in terms of advocacy and activism. Um, and we've tried to provide lots of resources and abilities and learning tools for our fellow allies, um, as well as a space for marginalized individuals to have and to show their work and to talk and to share their experiences. So um, for folks tuning in, you can go to keishadances.com under the Living All Marginalized tab, and there's all sorts of different little pieces of information. There's timelines and resources available. So. Um, that's a good place to start if you want to learn more about the exhibition itself. Today I am joined by three artists featured in Living While Marginalized. We have Jennifer Jules, Stephanie Chambers, and Sylvia Ramos, as well as two members from the South Okanagan, Okanagan Immigrant Society, Cherry and Sugan. Um, Jennifer, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, thank you for having me on the panel, Keisha. It's quite a pleasure. My name is Jennifer Jules. My pronouns are she and her. I own a clinical counseling center in Penticton. I have been in clinical counseling for about 27 years. And my primary focus is on post-traumatic stress disorder and also living while racialized. I have a lot of training and experience in post-traumatic slave syndrome and in what it means to have, to live in a place that is colonized. Um, and it all, all my work is with a trauma focus. I'm new to the art scene, and these are, these are my first pieces that have been in an exhibition. Thank you very Keisha for accepting them. And they are primarily um, me trying to take the next step of my work with um, advocacy to do um, advocacy through art and um, anti-Black racism awareness and education through art. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Sylvia, do you want to chat a little bit about yourself? 
Uh, yes, so my name is Sylvia. My pronouns are she, her, and I am a Mexican Canadian um, artist. Uh, much like Jennifer, these are my this is my first piece ever having been exhibited. I'm a very um, beginning artist as far as uh, showing my work goes. Um, thank you, Keisha, so much. This has been so amazing. Um, also, thank you to everyone for allowing me to be on the panel. Um, and I'm very starting out in art, but um, I've always thought of it as a good way to use my, my want to um, be in activism and be sharing um, what I can and using my privilege in a way to allow other people to see the beauty, especially my piece is uh, specifically for bisexual people. Um, in the Latino community, they're quite anti, I guess, homophobic, anti, anti homophobic, anti all of that. So um, I wanted to use it as a way to show how beautiful sexuality is and all of that. And it was really cool to get an opportunity to share that with everyone. So thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, Stephanie, let's hear about you a little. So hi, everybody. Um, I'm Stephanie Chambers. I'm a Cree, Métis, and mixed uh, beadwork artist uh, from Calgary, Alberta, in Treaty 7 territory. Um, I started doing beadwork about a year and a half ago. Um, it's something that I always wanted to sort of reclaim about my background and my culture, but uh, I had a job that was very time consuming before and I wasn't able to. And so the minute that I was, it's something that I really invested a lot of time and a lot of work in, and it has brought me closer to my community and allowed me to be a representative for my community. And um, yeah, I'm terrible at talking about myself, so I'm going to pass it on to somebody else, but happy to be here and happy to see all of the rest of you. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, Cherry, you want to chat a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. So my name is Cherry Fernandez, and I'm joined here actually with Sagun Cora. Um, and we are both from the South Okanagan Immigrant and Community Services. Um, I'm the executive director here, and we we really um, support newcomers in our region from the South Okanagan Similkameen. So that's from Summerland down to the border of Asoyas and then out west towards Princeton. Um, a lot of our work is around uh, language acquisition, um, settlement, understanding the Canadian uh, workplace. Um, and adjusting anything that they need to to really adjust and and to um, build that sense of belonging in their new home and this is particularly i think um very personal for a lot of our team um because either personally or with the people that we work with and um this year particular with a lot of the tensions that have been going on it has become one of our very much a priority of us our organization and our team um, that we actually created um, a video without any experience using a camera <laughs> um, learning that the wind can be very loud <laughs> in that process uh, but really just feeling that that need to help um, bring awareness about the diversity that we have here and that that need that it does exist here and we need to to create more inclusive spaces and and have more allies um, is very much a, important for all of our teams so um, if I can I'd like to share that video with everyone here today um, and give some perspective of where we're coming from as well and uh, help frame some of our conversations later. So I'll just share my screen. <laughs> Mommy, you like being brown? Why don't I 
that lift us up in times of crisis and uncertainty. To those that do their part every day where we work, learn, play, and live. To those that recognize and value our connection. Thank you.
Okay, that was fantastic. Um, I'm sure some of us have seen that floating around the media. It's gotten great coverage, which is fabulous. It's much needed, I think, um, right now. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Is there anything else either of you would like to chat about, um, about SOIX? Um, I think maybe when we get into the discussions, um, this video really came out of what we were experiencing here and, and the needs that we were seeing. And um, I think it's very much related to, to what we'll be speaking about today. Perfect. That sounds great. Thank you. Okay. So let's move into the arts talk um, of this panel. So we're going to hear from our artists right now uh, a little bit more specifically to their pieces and kind of what it means to them and their experiences as artists. Um, so we'll get into that and then after we'll have a little opportunity for all of us to engage with the artists. Um, you know, if we have any questions or comments about what we've seen. I wish I had thought to post photos of your works today, um, but they're all accessible. Uh, we had a virtual tour with the Penticton Art Gallery, which is on their website and on their Instagram. So if you want to go back after this and take a look at the works, please do that. They're all phenomenal. So without further, uh, without further ado, <laughs> we'll start with Jennifer. Can you just tell us a little bit about your piece and yourself as an artist? Sure. So um, I've always considered myself an amateur photographer. And I find photography catches moments in time. And I always try and catch the essence and the meaning of that moment rather than having necessarily the perfect clarity of a picture technically. And I had the great fortune in 2019 to go to several countries in Africa and along the coast um, where the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade was. And one of the things that I found was a whole bunch of memorials there where they promising to never ever have their children and their mothers and their fathers taken away again. And this was very profound for me as a black woman living in Canada. My father's from Trinidad and um, he, he, his family is a family um, based in slavery. And um, we've always never really discussed that Africa connection. And for me seeing all this effort, whether it's um, encapsulating the, the the slave castles where we were kept or huge monuments and statues representing our people who fought to not be enslaved and to those who were. It, I took several pictures in that and, and it left me feeling that here in Canada, we aren't really free. We think that we're free in many cases because our racism that happens with anti-black racism is really kind of a subtle racism. It's a flight from racism. And there's nothing that's documented. We don't document it. So what I wanted to do is I felt that if I could take these pieces that I saw and the people that I met, some are from Africa, some are from here from Canada and photographs of their faces, all with permission, that if people could see us as human beings, people could see us as joyous and strong and resilient, they would, they would hopefully one day stop killing us. And so it all centered around me having to give my son when he was a certain age the talk as being a black mother. I was a single mom at the time and all throughout my children's lives, we've always had to have the talk about how to be safe and be black, how to deal with racism, how to navigate this world that sees us differently and how sometimes a subtlety when we don't know having how to call it out as racism for yourself so you understand it and when it's safe for other people. And so what I decided was the talk, we have to stop being able to give the talk. And the only way we have to stop having to give the talk is if we can free our children and free ourselves so that we're safe, that we're safe, that we can walk the street safe, that the police won't harm us. And so the first piece in my, it's a trilogy, the first piece is of a memorial that was in um, Zanzibar and it's a, a slave with a chain around his neck. And I put the names of all the people that I could find online that were killed by police and their dates and their ages, the youngest one being five years old. And I did them in red because I wanted to symbolize the blood and the loss of these lives. There's no databases in Canada for racialized deaths. And this doesn't include BIPOC community. This was just black people. And I wanted, I, I wanted if people could see that we are dying as BIPOC at the hands of police, maybe there'll be pause to think so we can re, rework the system, whether it's through defunding the police, 
and creating different programs. We need strong systemic change. And then the second piece was me doing a video of one of the talks I had to give my son. And he was young then, he was 11, he's an autistic, um, high functioning young man now. And what it meant, it's like you're watching, you're getting the talk from me. And I really wanted to people just to be able to hear, this is what I have to tell my children and feel what it meant to feel that. And then the third piece is of all the beautiful, not all, but of some of the beautiful faces that I took and all around them in the same red are words of who these people are, empowering, loving, mother, daughter, sister, brother. Because I thought that if you could see us, you'd love us and you'd hold us and then maybe we could stop the killing. So that's basically what my art piece was like. And like I said, it was my first piece. I do plan on doing more pieces. I'm just not too sure how it's going to translate yet as I'm still developing and growing as an artist. Thank you, Keisha. Thank you, Jennifer. And I can attest it is, it's incredibly powerful. It's a very beautiful piece. Um, Stephanie, would you like to chat a little bit about yourself as an artist and your piece that's featured? Okay, so the piece I submitted was um, entitled Mixed Blood. So I am Cree Métis and mixed European. I'm obviously a, a white passing Indigenous person. And that's been something that's been both beautiful and also a constant struggle for me my whole life. I've spent a lot of my life trying to make the white people around me more comfortable with my identity and to not feel threatened and to not come across as being an aggressive indigenous woman <laughs> and um as i you know came into adulthood i just hit a point where <clears throat> it had become so exhausting trying to make other people comfortable and not acknowledging very openly and publicly my mixed race and my background that i just sort of broke and decided that I was going to be very openly who I am, uh, despite the discomfort of other people. There's been a long history in the community, even in the Indigenous community in the past, of a lot of hostilities on both sides for mixed race people. We sort of exist in this place between two worlds. And um, I wanted to do a piece that would show that those two worlds don't necessarily have to be at odds with one another, that they can blend together to become a third world, something that is beautiful and strengthened by both. And so the piece I submitted um, has on one side of it, the Métis uh, flower with quills and beads. And on the other, I beaded uh, a piece of wheat for the European side of my family. And all combined, it makes you know a different thing, a beautiful thing, and something that I'm very, very proud of. And um, I intend to pass along to my own child and make sure that he grows up feeling like a strong, proud, Indigenous person, a mixed person, um, and not spending his life trying to make other people comfortable with that, but trying to spend his life sharing that beauty and that strength with other people. Yeah. Thank you, Stephanie. That's beautiful. And again, the artwork's phenomenal. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, Sylvia. Okay. Um, so as I said before, my piece um, was an alcohol ink piece, which is something I've been working with for probably about a year now only. Um, I've been an artist my whole life. I've been doing art my whole life and doing traditional art. Sometimes I found it a bit more stressful, a bit more pressure to make things that looked right and realistic. And I started doing abstract more recently and found that that was just a much better way to let out emotions and feelings. And it was more about the feeling and purpose of the painting than whether or not it actually looked realistic or perfect as far as you know ratios and rules of art and all of that um and so my piece i very very specifically did in the colors of the bisexual flag and my experience with being bisexual is quite um 
linked to my experience being Mexican Canadian. So my father is a Mexican immigrant. Um, he grew up in Mexico, my whole family is still there. Um, and my mom is a white Canadian. Um, so for me, myself being split halfway down the middle has always been a little bit uh, weird and uncomfortable as far as identity goes and my culture on either side. And I obviously look very white and get the privilege of passing as that every day. And that in itself is interesting in the way that other white people will talk to me thinking that I am white and will, you know, corroborate or agree with their statements that are sometimes very racist um, and what they feel comfortable saying to me. Um, and as most people know, the Latino community through colonization is primarily Catholic and that includes my family and they are very traditional and very strictly religious. And though I am not the first um, gay LGBTQ person in my family, I'm the first one who's really talked about it too much. My family doesn't talk about it. And when I created this specific piece was after having a rather hurtful conversation with my father about bisexuality and LGBTQ people and just his stance as being someone who was devoutly Catholic and growing up somewhere where this was not talked about. And if somebody identified that way, they didn't talk about it. And so I created that piece in order to be a, a source of pride somewhere that I needed to see that my sexuality could be beautiful and everything about that could be beautiful. And um, though it's the colors of the bisexual flag, it's also come to be a little bit about the melding of cultures. The bisexual flag is pink and blue and melts to purple in the middle. And you could look at that as the way of having white and brown parents and melding in the middle and being somewhere in the middle and trying to find the beauty in that and trying to find where you stand on that spectrum of being a mixed person in between the two places. Um, so I hope it was a, an act of pride for me when I needed it. And I hope that it could be the same for other people. And I really just wanna continue making art that can be a source of pride and beauty for people in their identities, whatever that is. Thank you. Thank you so much. And as well, the piece is absolutely lovely. Very, very powerful. Uh, before we move on to the uh, questions, uh, are there any comments anybody wants to make or does anyone have any questions for the artists about any of their pieces? Okay, no problem. So again, I encourage everybody to take a look at the Penticton Art Gallery's website um, and Instagram page to look at the uh, virtual tour if you don't get a chance to see it in person. And it runs until the 15th, which is this Saturday. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and start asking these questions. And to the panelists, if you can just um, continue the conversation without me introducing each person. So just go in the order we discussed and after the person has finished speaking and muted themselves, you can start and we'll kind of continue that way. Um, okay, so over the past year and a bit, which we kind of touched on a little earlier, um, we kind of saw this big uprising in the fight for civil rights. Uh, and then initially this started kind of as a focal point on Black Lives Matter with the killing of George Floyd. But as the year kind of went on and specifically to the last, I don't know, probably six months, we kind of saw an uprising in other communities also uh, creating movements and protests and creating great meaningful change. Um, and this has been met with great controversy as well as great revolution, I think. Um, so my question is, as, um, as people maybe either within these communities or as allies, what are some of the things you've experienced um, throughout the last year in terms of this uh, kind of civil rights movement? And we'll start with Stephanie. Okay, so in the last year, I think um, there has been, as a white passing indigenous person, I think it's been um, more confronting for me than ever having a lot of my white peers come to me with questions about what is going on. They want to know my perspective on it. I am sometimes the only Indigenous person they know um, because I you know, look like them. Sometimes I'm a more comfortable person for them to talk to. And so I've been confronted with a lot of questions. 
about um, indigenous rights and even black rights, which is something that I feel not totally qualified to comment on as I'm not a black person myself, but the, the sort of tenor of everything has been like, it's been wonderful and it's also been very frustrating. So on the one hand, I'm so happy that these issues are sort of coming to the forefront of the public consciousness. Um, that's been very liberating for me. It's allowed me to have more complex, uh, very needed conversations with people in my community. But on the other hand, it is always kind of sad and frustrating when things need to escalate to such a level for the, you know, the general population to see us, for us to become visible to them. Um, so it's been a year of um, very tough conversations with people. Um, a lot of deep conversations with people who I might not have otherwise had them with, um, in which I hope I'm doing more good than harm, but also a year of becoming frustrated with people as well and uh, wanting people to, for us to be visible to people without things having to escalate to such a degree. That's been sort of my most, um, like my primary experience with it. Um, for me, the past year has been interesting in terms of allyship and in terms of the civil rights movement that's risen up. On the one hand, um, Black and Indigenous people have often aligned themselves together because so much of the racism that exists in Canada has predominantly been um, in terms of uh, the stats and of racialized ways of viewing the world, Indigenous and Black. And it was almost sometimes like a balance, either it was anti-Black racism, anti-Indigenous racism, or both combined. And so there were some bits that were refreshing in that I felt that a lot of my Indigenous colleagues or friends uh, were able, or people that I ended up meeting over the past year, were able to really um, be a true ally. But the flip side of that is that um, as Blacks in Canada, um, we've basically been erased. And so what I did find frustrating is we, um, were tr when there was, for example, a protest in Penticton, um, it became very focused on the indigenous story. And, and I understand that they were say, trying to support what it meant to have racism in our community, but it kind of dismissed that this was about anti-black racism. And I feel one of the biggest struggles that we have had as black people is that our voices are continually dismissed and the black anti-black racism continues to exist. And so I found that very tiring. I found like I was battling to be heard even in a civil rights movement that was supposed to be about black people. And I found that it was difficult to find a, a way of expressing it without being turned into the rhetoric of the black angry woman who doesn't listen and isn't wanting to do um, anything to actually make a, a, a change. So I felt, in many ways, a lot of the um, allyship was performative. Um, and it wasn't intentional. And, you know, I understand where it came from, but I did find that um, it, that was a struggle for me. And always um, the struggle of having to have the conversation with um, other members of the community, white people, uh, other, um, other races about what anti-Black racism actually was, was there's this level of always having to explain over and over again, when this is something we've been living with and it hasn't changed since Canada has been Canada, we've had anti-Black racism. And so for me, part of it was, I felt like this, this dialectic where we had on the one hand, I got some really great support. I had people, white people, indigenous people, POCs being extreme allies and, and really trying and then, on the other hand, I felt like I had to do more work. And it was tiring because it's like a band-aid was ripped open with this civil rights movement and everything that we've known that's existed all the time as a black woman and as a black man and as black children always has existed and everybody now wants us to educate them on that. And I found that quite tiring. Thank you. Um, so for me, I think the part, obviously looking um, very white, I kind of saw myself more of the anti-Asian racism that has come up recently, um, where I work has several 
um, East Asian immigrants working there as well. And I work reception. And I have a lot of the time people who do not want to see our Asian colleagues, um, specifically because they're Asian. And so that um, has been something that's been very blatant to me, um, viewing it. And, you know, over the phone, I have no accent. If they see me, I, I, I'm not, I'm white. I don't, you know, look like I'm Asian or anything. Um, so people feel comfortable saying those things to me. And I, on the one hand, I don't like being aligned with that, that they assume that I would agree with them, but also, you know, we are the ones with privilege. They are the one, we, they think that it's normal for us to look down as on immigrants or people of color as being, you know, that we are the majority, we are this is whatever. And it, it's, it's, it's definitely anger inducing and sometimes you don't know what to do. Sometimes there's not enough to do. I've been trying to stay, you know, in the, the backlight a little bit, allowing other people to speak and just, you know, signing as many petitions as I can, donating money where I can, educating myself where I can, and hoping at some point there will be a good answer of what I should be doing. Um, and hoping that things get better, hoping that real change happens, knowing that there are movements, you know, coming and going for different communities. Uh, you know, four years ago, there was, there was the Latino movement around the time of Trump. And of course, you know, um, every time a case of police brutality goes viral, then that becomes a movement. And we keep seeing them come back and come back and changes being made, but not enough. And you just have to hope that at some point, real change will happen for everyone. I think for, for us, we, we see this a lot with the people that we help, um, particularly in light of COVID-19 and the anti-Asian racism that we're seeing. We, we, we've seen a lot of that. Um, and many of um, the people that we help and, and serve, they, they are afraid to to speak out um, for fear of backlash um, to their themselves or their family or risking their livelihoods um, and i think uh, it's been touched on already it's only now that yes this has been going on it's nothing new um, but it's only now that it's getting some media attention uh, just in the last year alone in our region, there has been so many different instances of um, vandalism in, in Asoyas with the indigenous pictographs, um, with the bullying that you heard on our video, uh, with graffiti on resident homes in, in Summerland of a family that is a visible minority. And, and just most recently, um, to realtors receiving threats because they're of Asian descent. Um, it's something that, that we do see here, um, both with the people we serve, but also personally. Um, that video that I shared earlier was actually inspired by my own daughter when she was two years old and she started interacting with her peers in, in bigger groups. She went from being this very loud and, and um, a very strong little girl who loved to talk and share her opinions and could speak in two languages. She went from being that to suddenly very quiet. And I didn't know what's happening. At first I thought, oh, she's, maybe this is what they mean when they talk about separation anxiety. But it wasn't until months later, and she asked me the question, mommy, do you like being brown? That I saw what was happening, that I realized that this is a cycle that I experienced myself growing up in the Okanagan, but now see it happening with my girls. And, um, what I hope with that video is that, that it's going to inspire people to talk, 
that we get more conversations going, um, that it is just a launching pad for more things that we can do. Um, but I can, a lot of what has said, been said already resonates with me. It's exhausting. It's exhausting having to talk um, frequently about what it is. And it's a lot of it's like, it's very negative and it's uncomfortable, but it's okay to be uncomfortable because it should be. It's racism. It shouldn't be something that's comfortable and acceptable. Um, but I do wanna encourage people to get out there and, and, and get educated and learn more. If there's something that you may question, um, try to find out reach out to people in your network and but don't depend on that we live in a world where we have so many resources today where we can pull from and learn about the history and we should be taking advantage of that um and and who i am today and who i was three years ago when my little girl asked that is very different so i really do encourage people to to learn more. It's not about being perfect. It's just about doing better. It's acknowledging that, hey, this was a mistake or this caused hurt and pain. And going forward from that and doing better, improving. I think that's um, where sometimes people are afraid to find out, but don't, don't let that be a something that stops you from learning or finding out or speaking and getting in these conversations. Thank you everybody for sharing. Um, I know that this topic can be uncomfortable, but also just really emotional. So I do thank you um, a lot for being so open with uh, me and also with the people who are watching today. Um, and so my next question has kind of been touched on, but uh, I'll, I'll ask it and we can narrow in a little bit. So with this kind of uprising or what I have called a civil rights movement, um, and it's global, it's international, we are seeing a lot of folks who aren't racialized, who aren't Indigenous, um, who are kind of waking up for the first time. It's like they just woke up and they don't, you know, it's they're getting, they're downloading all of this information that they didn't really understand or didn't have the knowledge before. Um, and it's been really shocking and really intense for them. And a big, in my circle, I think probably every day in the last year, I've had somebody reach out with really intense questions, um, just trying to be better allies. So what maybe, what are some things, some ad pieces of advice, some tips, tips um, that you can give to these people who are trying to become allies, who are up and coming, who are just starting this journey, or who maybe have been doing this for a while, um, but need a little bit extra support as things get really heated? Well, I think that's a very good question. And I agree that we are in the midst of a civil rights movement on anti-Black racism. And I believe it's a worldwide movement as well. I think it's the first time that we've actually had an anti-Black civil rights movement that has touched almost every major country in the world, regardless of the first world country or third world country. And that's because of the good thing about the internet and people now being able to film what's going on for black people. So I think you calling it a civil rights movement is, is accurate. I think historically it's gonna be seen as that. And I think that what we do right now is gonna make a big difference in terms of how this is gonna shift. Uh, it can become the next meme or true systemic change can happen. And I think that our allies are, a lot of our allies are working really hard to make that true systemic change ha to happen. The question is, is how do you deal with the white fragility that is always, that comes to play? And that's just that feeling of discomfort that comes inside of you where you want to defend because you're not the person who did this to these people. And it's hard that you benefit from the privilege of being white and you don't want to have to have this, these difficult conversations. And so one of the things that I like to tell some of my allies or um, students that I work with or clients that I work with is that, you know, get, get to know what it means to be a Canadian and the racism that exists in your own country. And if you're in a different country, get to know the racism that exists in that country itself. 
we get so overwhelmed with Americanism sometimes, and we, we tend to be quite arrogant in a very polite Canadian way of saying, this isn't us though. We're lucky we're not living in the States though. This isn't as bad there. So I tell them the things that you can do is you can educate yourself. Instead of coming to me or to Keisha or to any one of you guys on the panel or to somebody else of color, please take the time first to educate yourself a little bit and then ask questions if you don't understand. Um, there's nine books that I often recommend and they're all Canadian and they're all about um, being black in Canada essentially. And I, I think that each one of them has very specific things to offer our allies and to people who want to be make a change. Uh, the top one being Desmond Cole's um, seminal book on social injustice and racism, uh, The Skin We Are In. Uh, he gave up his job at the Toronto Star. He's one of the most prolific reporters and one of the most well-known reporters in Canada. And he was forced to give it up because he started documenting anti-Black racism in Canada. And they were told that it went against his mandate. And so he decided to just write one year, 2017, a book. Every month, something different that happened for anti-Black racism. And then chart the history of where that came from. So that there's an understanding. So if there's one book out of those nine, that'd be a book that I would give every single person who wants to have a little bit of understanding. He's a really good starting point. The other eight are great as well, but he's a really good starting point. Thank you, Jennifer, for sharing that. Um, and uh, wonderful. And I'd like to extend and share what learning I had uh, with my colleagues. We attended a training a few days back it was given by Hollaback, and Hollaback, for if uh, you all don't know, it's a nonprofit organization that um, raises awareness about combating harass um, harassment, both online and uh, or in person through intervention trainings. So um, they told something about a 5D approach that can be used by a bystander or somebody who wants to be, a, um, you know, stand against racism. So um, they talk about five Ds. The first being uh, distract. When you see somebody in a situation, in an incident, uh, you can distract the offender and uh, de-escalate the situation. It can be a very subtle way of intervening in a you know, hate incident. Uh, the idea is to ignore the harasser and then engage in a totally different um, completely different uh, topic. And uh, so it can be something that you can pretend to uh, be lost, ask for time, spill something, just distract and uh, try and deescalate the situation. The second D that they talked about is uh, delegate. So if you feel you are not in a position to actually act, you can delegate it to someone and ask for help from bystanders, other bystanders and uh, maybe ask from somebody who has more authority. Maybe if you are in a store and you face uh, that, you see that somebody is facing discrimination or is you know being harassed, you can ask some, the store manager to intervene. Or maybe if you are in a bus, you can ask the driver to intervene. Uh, the third D that they talked about was document. So which is very important. Um, and if possible, you know, the bystander can uh, capture a video of the incident or take down notes or take down the details. Uh, the fourth one they talked about was delay. Uh, so that is when somebody, the bystander cannot act during the incident, which is perfectly fine if they don't feel safe doing that. They can at least go to the person who has been harassed or the victim and talk to them and say that they are there for the support and they're sorry for that, what that, what has happened. Uh, that gives a lot of support to somebody who's just faced some very bad incident. Uh, the fifth one is direct, which is a little risky, but uh, we should always keep our safety in mind and then intervene and speak directly to the offender and uh, you know maybe shout out loud and say that this is not appropriate this is nothing that you know you can say uh, and confront the offender so this was uh, my take uh, from a very important um, you know 
training that I attended and I'd like to share the link for for any of our viewers or the panelists if they want to attend the Hollaback training. I will share the link in the chat. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, I think the biggest one that I could suggest to people as being someone who had the privilege of getting to learn about much of this racism rather than having it be something that I faced since the time I was growing up and knowing other people of color as well who may think of yourself as being, or LGBTQ people who think of yourself as, oh, I'm marginalized, well, I'm discriminated against as well. Know that it's not a one size fits all, that you may experience discrimination and racism and homophobia or transphobia, but that doesn't mean that you can't be the perpetrator of other racism and problematic bigoted behavior towards somebody else. So definitely take the time to educate yourself about communities that you're also not a part of because you know you may be part of one community but you're not part of the other and you don't understand the struggles of everybody and you need to educate yourself about all those different aspects because we live in a place where we have people of all of those races and ethnicities and groups and all of that. Um, the other one is it's okay to look back at your own behavior and look at what was wrong, learn from it, see what you did that was wrong. If you can apologize, if you can't, just don't do it again. Try to educate yourself so that it's something that you don't continue to perpetuate. Um, and look at your own families as well. Um, with people who are either white or of non-marginalized groups or even people who are marginalized groups, our own families can hold a lot of racism. Um, the Latino community specifically holds a lot of colorist, anti-Black, anti-Indigenous um, racism in our community. And so look at your families, look at what they are doing to perpetuate that and how you can break that cycle of unlearning some of the things that may have been taught to you growing up and that maybe you didn't question at the time because they were being told to you by your parents or your, the authorities in your family who were supposed to teach you what was right maybe learn that some of them were wrong. Um, I think that's probably the best thing I can say is try to listen pe to people of the community as well. Um, if you're trying to learn about black rights, listen to black people. If you're trying to learn about indigenous issues, listen to indigenous people, you know, listen to people of the community. Yeah, so, um... I thoroughly agree with everything that you guys have put forth for sure. I think the one thing that I would add for allies who are looking to do a better job is that I wish more often that people would really listen to what we're saying. I feel like very frequently people hear the words that are coming out of our mouth, but they're not listening to the message that we're trying to convey. They're not really, really absorbing what we're saying because this shield of fragility goes up and feeling attacked and feeling like we're blaming them for something and they just, the listening just stops. And people will sometimes regurgitate talking points, but they don't really, they're not really absorbing the message. They're not really taking the time to delve into it deeper and hear the tough things that people have to say to them. And as Sylvia just pointed out, it's not just white people, it's people within other communities where if we are not willing to listen to our, the people around us who are part of different communities telling us, um, hey, like you have done something that has upset me or, you know, uh, you're indigenous and like, you're distracting in this instance from black issues. Those are things that we need to be willing to hear people say to each other. We need to absorb that and we need to be better. So I wish that people would listen more to other people. And I would say to allies as well, once you have listened and you have heard the message that people have to say, do not be afraid to take that to uh, the other white people or non-marginalized people in your life, do not be afraid to speak up for those issues because 
often your voice is heard much more loudly and much more strongly than for people of color. And it's very important for you to actively fight against what is going on and to spread those points to people who are not as open as you and are not as active as you. Um, so yeah, listen and listen and share. Yeah. May I add something? I think um, it's really important for our allies, um, whether BIPOC allies or white allies, to start taking action you know, to start dismantling the systems that are causing um, this world to be filtered through a racist lens. And we can talk and we can commemorate, we can do all these things, but we now have to start with whatever we're doing, whether a teacher, whether we're a candlestick maker, whatever we're doing to slowly change the system so that, um, so that it is safe for people to speak out as you uh, have mentioned, and to be able to feel brave enough and know that they're not going to be dismissed or, or injured. I think that um, also uh, part of it is understanding what the systemic underlying racism is, and that's through more education and learning, because if you don't see it as racist, you're not gonna call it out, you know? You're not gonna, if you can't, if you can't see it, if it's just the norm, you're not gonna do anything. And I think we've gotta get, um, we got to continue the, the storytelling and the talks and the understanding of what it means, but now we have to take action and start changing a system that's been in place since, since colonization started um, in order for things to really change. Thank you. Um, I think that those are all fantastic points and there's a lot of learning that can be done from just that question. I also thought I would just add um, what a big trend I saw uh, was white allies getting really passionate and excited and um, coming up with different ways to provide support um, in the moment, which was fantastic. But a big part of what was missing was that a lot of those strategies had actually been created by the Black Panthers um, or, or uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and his, his group and committee and organizations. And a lot of these um, like proactive things that white allies are starting to do um, have been happening for a really long time. So my one of my points of advice would be if you're looking at getting proactive and taking the next step past just educating yourself, make sure that you're giving those accolades and credits where they're due. Make sure that if you're using different methods and steps um, for your allyship, that you're aligning yourself with the right person who started it, that you're giving those accolades and giving that right credit. Um, because a lot of these things have already been created and have been happening for decades, right? They, and they weren't created by white people. So just making sure that when we start getting proactive, when we start getting dirty and doing really active things, that we're doing it respectfully and we're not stepping over people in the process. So um, I'll just move to our next topic or question. And this also has been brought up, but again, we can kind of narrow in a little bit. Um, so with this kind of waking up, people are also really shocked, right? And so Will Smith said something along the lines in 2020 saying, you know, racism isn't new, these things aren't new, but now it's being filmed. Because before it wasn't as actively filmed and documented. Um, and so for a lot of people that, that shock, you know, and that, um, surprise, it has different reactions um, because people of color are not <laughs> shocked or surprised. We know that this has been happening for a really long time. Um, so I thought maybe we could just talk about that, you know, that a little bit. Um, if anybody has any thoughts or comments about this general shock and awakening um, and maybe some steps we can take or just comments in general. I think one thing that's common for white people seeing that happening is kind of this knee-jerk reaction of there must be something else going on. Oh, well, 
the police can't really just be shooting a, a black person for no reason or whatever. And we like there's this knee jerk reaction of defense or believing that it can't be possible and get past that because it is. And if you talk to people who are part of the community, they know that it is very real and we need to stop looking for all of these reasons to defend the racist behavior. Um, we see it time and time again with, I think the most common one that we see is police brutality victims is trying to say, oh, well, they committed this crime and they did this and they raised their voice and all of that kind of stuff as a way of almost defending the perpetrator. And we need to absolutely just get away from that because it's not productive. It's not helpful towards anything. And that first reaction of defense doesn't help anybody. It helps no one except the institutions of white privilege. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, I hope with the fact that these things are being filmed out, we'll force um, people to be held accountable. I'd like to think that that's the way things will go now. Um, I think it'll maybe happen a little bit. We saw the um, we've seen now a little bit of maybe arrests or, you know, some kind of accountability with a few people and hopefully it's just the starting point now. Um, but I think, I think the, the fact that it's being filmed and shared is good. It'll force people who could deny it, they can't deny it anymore because it's on camera and it's right here. And now you have to look at it and you have to acknowledge it. Um, and hopefully you have to do something about it. So I think um, speaking as an Indigenous person, we are seen often as one of two things, either being totally invisible to people or being a problem that people need to deal with. Um, these two states are not a good way for us to exist. Um, often when things happen to us, uh, it's not even covered in the, the news. It's just seen as a sort of de facto part of everyday life. Um, there's a lot of extremely negative stereotypes um, attributed to Indigenous people that allow people to just brush us away of, uh, as being deserving of the treatment that we get, especially when it comes to the results of uh, intergenerational trauma, um, things like alcoholism and drug abuse. We are just brushed off as being violent, angry drunks, um, that it was necessary for the authorities to take as strong a hand with us as they did because we were out of control. Um, we have an absolute epidemic in our country of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls that continues to be under addressed. Um, we have a huge intersection in the Indigenous community of people who are both Black and Indigenous who continuously have those identities presented to them as being mutually exclusive, which is completely unacceptable. Um, and in terms of people filming these things, um, we just had, you know, on May 5th was the day of recognizing missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. There was a, a large amount of people in my community who posted stories about it, families who shared memories, and these things were all removed from Instagram. Um, so even filming things, uh, if we don't um, speak up when we see things being removed, when we see things being pushed out of the consciousness, when we see people creating straw man arguments for things and diverting from our point, um, it's important for everybody, for allies and people within the community to continue to push these stories and this evidence forward so that people have to continue to confront it because we've all been invisible and forgotten for so long that if we do not push we will be pushed right into invisibility again so that's my that's my thoughts on that i can completely agree and i can tell that we're already already right now being pushed into invisibility again I mean, if you look at, let's say, just the vaccinations, I'm not saying whether you agree with them or not, in Canada for COVID, uh, you look at, you know, in Ontario, the, the biggest population, and it's the Finch area in, in Toronto, um, is Black and Indigenous people, and they're not getting their vaccines, and they're begging for them, and they're wanting to do the vaccines. When you look at how 
the voices of Black and Indigenous men and women, especially women, have been completely silenced. When you look at the performative, and I'm going to get a little political here, I'm sorry, but when you look at the performative actions of our current Prime Minister, who actually silenced both an Indigenous powerful woman in a, in a, and a Black powerful woman to the point where they both felt that they had to resign. And when the Black person tried to resign with dignity, he actually called her and told her not to resign for a couple of weeks because it wouldn't look good on him. And then he, she actually said, F you, and told him to hang up because it was such a performative thing and such a disappointment. And then the backlash those two women got, being angry people of color who are female, um, that by their own community saying, you should have stayed at the table. Well, they couldn't stay at the table because the table was so performative. And I think that silencing is very, very slowly happening right now. We're becoming a meme. We're becoming the next, the next topic is going to come. And I think we need to speak out and continue not just filming it. As you're saying, it's easy to be erased, but we need to speak out. We need to write about it. We need to talk to people when it's happening. You know, we need to study it. You know, the civil rights movement in Canada has been going on since like the early 40s. And we know nothing about it. If you look at the ninth floor, there's a huge civil rights um, thing that was happening that was in 1963, I believe. And you look at um, Mr. Jane and Finch. I mean, he did such an amazing job to try and become mayor so he could do uh, the change for the Indigenous and Black people. And he was shut out completely. They actually changed the voting ways of having him be able to vote so that he would not get in. And he was just this old Black man who wanted to make a difference to Black and Indigenous people on, on Finch Street. And so I think we have to be really careful because it's so easy for us to turn to the next thing. And I think Will Smith was very wise in saying it's always been there. So what's going to happen when those films are now turned to something different? Yeah, I am um, kind of looking at this in the, in the framework of where we work. We've been part of dialogues up and down the valley for many, many years now. And in these dialogues, we have participants who are sharing personal stories of that they've experienced here, not in some other community that they experienced here. And yet each time at the end of a dialogue, there people still walk away thinking, oh, we're not that bad here. That doesn't happen here. They're just trying to make our, give us a bad reputation. So there's this persistent denial that it doesn't exist, but it very much exists here. We, um, and one of the, the problems is that often it's not reported because there's so much fear about the backlash for you personally, for your family, um, or, or being labeled as angry and, and an extremist. Um, and so that data isn't out there. We, in January, launched a survey to, to do a, a mapping, basically. Um, we asked a question, if you have experienced or witnessed acts of racism or discrimination. And in just asking that question, us as an organization started getting backlash. We got emails, we had telephone calls that were threatening. When Interior Health decided to do an investigation into um, the racially motivated games that were being played amongst staff members, they received over 3,000 emails and telephone calls threatening them for just trying to find out I, um, that video that I had talked about with my, that was inspired by my own daughter, and she was three years old, it forced me to confront my role, what my role was in normalizing racism. Because yes, I'm a person of color, and yes, I am in a leadership position, so I absolutely have privilege. But I realized when she asked me that question, my not talking about my experience feeds into the myth that it doesn't happen here. So when everyone speaks about calling it out 
or sharing or talking about it, it is so critical that we continue to keep that at the forefront so that change actually does happen. I, um, in the last year, have had to speak about it more times than I have in my entire life. And in the last year, I have been told I'm too aggressive, that, um, that I will, oh, I'm going to forget this saying, that I will catch more, what is that? Um, you know, flies? Catch, catch, catch flies with honey than with vinegar. Yes, thank you. And all of these were really, it doesn't help. It's trying to detract from the message there. It is trying to silence those words. So I, I do want to encourage people to, 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 when they see it, to speak about it, to call it out. Um, and I, like I mentioned, I am not the same person I was three years ago. Um, and I am learning still. And, and really having my daughter ask me those questions really made me confront the fact that I am also a part of that because I had very much um, wanted people to feel comfortable around me. So when I was asked about what it was like to grow up here, I would joke about it and say, oh yes, I had to translate in this language or that language, which is very different from the Filipino language. Um, but it very much fed into that, that narrative that it doesn't exist, but it very much does. And that video that we had put together, the racist remarks that you hear are all sourced locally. They are from here, um, not somebody else's background, uh, backyard. Um, all the participants are residents here. And that was really important to us because we wanted to bring that voice forward. I think um, too often it is, is it, it is missed there and it's almost used as a excuse because they don't hear it, that it doesn't happen, but it does. So um, I, I very much agree with what's been said here about really learning more, um, calling it out when we see it and knowing where we have our role in that impact where we can make that difference. If it's okay, I think I wanna maybe add to that. I think doing videos like that's very important uh, because right now there is a lot of fear. There always has been, I mean, um, in, in the indigenous community and the black community because the BIPOC community all around because when you speak out and if you go to the authorities, you get sanctioned, you get dismissed, you get charged, you get ignored, you get denied, you get vilified. Um, when all this happened in this last year with George Floyd, um, Keisha wanted to do a panel of black business owners and she could not get any black business owners who were willing in the community to be on this panel and when I spoke to some of these black business owners personally about it, it was because they were afraid. They were afraid of the backlash of losing their businesses, of the violence that would happen to them. Um, they were afraid of the damage that could happen to their children and to their homes. And that's here in, in Penticton. We just started with Penticton. And then she tried to go to the Okanagan and still, People, there were a couple of people, but everybody was too afraid. And it wasn't a fear that was um, something you would think, but it's a legitimate fear. These are business owners who've been in business here for over 30 years, some of them. These are people who moved here five years ago, started a business, and had to sell and move their house because of the anti Black racism that they survived. These are people that that have been dismissed and denied. And I think that when we do videos like that, it's great for education, but it's difficult to speak out. I have a lot of trauma clients who are BIPOC and I work with a lot of indigenous uh, survivors and I work with a lot of other people of color. And when they go to the police, eight times out of 10, 
they are dismissed no matter how violent the crime or they are blamed. I had one client who was brutally almost killed, brutally. And the reply to the RCMP was, doesn't every brown girl have dirty hair and dirty feet? And no charges were laid. So when we talk about speaking out, we also have to be cogent of finding ways to speak out that's going to protect those of the BIPOC community that are speaking out. Because they can't speak out if their life is in danger for speaking out. Thank you. If I can just add, yeah, I absolutely agree with what you're saying there. And um, just even with that video itself, we had so many of our clients come forward and say, you know, this is what I'm experiencing, but I can't, I can't say anything. I don't, I don't want to lose my job. I don't want my children to be at risk um, because it's it's very much here, and um, and I think that's where we have to see each of us individually where our roles are. And and for me, because I am fortunate and privileged to be in an organization that that supports this work, I. I am in a position where I can say something, um, whereas some of our clients or other people in the community can't for fear, right? Um, and, and that's where I really had to confront myself in realizing, um, again, my role in that, because I had not prior to my little girl asking me that question, I, I hadn't spoke about it. So I truly was a part of feeding that narrative that it doesn't, that it doesn't, right, happen here. Um, being a person in a leadership position, a person of color, and and not talking about it when it very much is a part of um, what we see here on a daily basis with uh, either individually, personally, or within our clients. So. Um, I, I completely agree with what you say, Jennifer, being able to, to bring those voices forward, but to do it as well in a way that is safe um, for them to come forward. And, and we hear it all the time that it's the most underreported hate crime because there is that fear, that backlash. Um, there's the victim shaming that happens that, oh, something must be wrong with you. And, and, and things that aren't even related to the the incident start getting brought up and saying, oh, well, this is why she or he had deserved this. And, um, and that's, I think um, it was said earlier, we need to move away from that because it takes away from what has happened. We stop trying to improve the situation. Instead, we're looking, being completely distracted. I think that also, like, you know, all, I'm, I'm in a position of power too. I have a successful business. Um, I am upper middle class. I have a lot of rights and privilege that many of my BIPOC colleagues and friends and people do not have. I think part of the fear that we need to start dismantling is the fact that every single one of us BIPOC people, we came here because it was supposed to be the promised land. Books are written on that. There's a seminal book actually called A Place Called Heaven. And it's about how, in this case being black, but I contend being BIPOC, uh, except for indigenous, it's a different issue there. But how we all came here because it was supposed to be a place where it was diverse and multicultural and, and where racism didn't exist. And where we could start and have this beautiful land and that is so brainwashed in the Canadian society that we still believe it. We still believe that we all have equality. And with the indigenous, it's even more so because apparently because they were have reservations, they're supposed to forget about the residential school. And because now that they have free education and now they have free rights and have a voice, everything should be sunshine and lollipops. And the reality is it's not. And we are uncomfortable as a country of saying that. And, and our prime minister, again, is a classic example of the white privilege 
that actually thinks that he's making a huge difference in terms of the BIPOC community, where he's not, it's performative, but he doesn't see it, especially with the indigenous people and with the black people. And so I think, and with the Asian people and with the Indian people, all BIPOC. So I think when we look at it, it's, a part of it is, is addressing that myth that this is the promised land and this is the best that it is, because it can get way better. Thank you. Um, and on that note, I will uh, mention one of the installations at the exhibition uh, was a giant timeline called um, Canada's History with Systemic Marginalization. And it breaks down LGBTQ plus um, systemic marginalization, uh, immigrant and people of color systemic uh, marginalization and black and indigenous as well. And it has three tiers. So, it, and it goes from the 1800s up until present in decades. Um, and that's accessible on keishadances.com as well. Because one of the questions I get a lot is, how did we end up here? Why are we here? Why, why is this happening? Well, it always has, right? And so let's actually look at some of the legislations, the laws, the bills that have been enacted over the you know, last 200 years. And before that, let's look at some of these major points in time as to what led us here. Um, but I would, now this, this isn't a part of our pre-arranged questions, but I think it's an important question to bring up. So if you're comfortable, please answer. And if not, that's okay. Um, but we've got some extra time. So I've heard from the voices today here that um, when we try to speak up, there's that kind of uh, narrative that we're too angry, aggressive, mad, you end up being the angry, whatever, insert whatever, <laughs> angry person, right? Um, and so that brings me to this, this topic of tone policing um, and also the idea of differentiating between folks who are simply marginalized or people of color, Black and Indigenous or people of color, and people who are choosing to be allies and advocates within their communities. So my question is, um, well, I guess it's not really a question, but it's more of a, a comment or a theme discussion. Um, with Another thing that I get a lot from allies is that whole, you know, it would be a lot easier if people were just nicer to me when I ask questions. It would be a lot easier. I could learn more. Other people could learn more if people were just nicer. Okay, well, there's an inherent difference between people who are choosing to be allies and advocates within their own communities and educate and provide resources and people who are simply racialized, Indigenous, Black, or people of color, right? And I guess I'd like to just talk a little bit about our experiences with the tone policing from allies who are trying to gain information and then, you know, calling us angry or upset or mad, um, and also kind of highlight that it's not necessarily appropriate just to go up to somebody because they're a person of color and ask them a really loaded question and expect calmness and kindness in return. Sorry, it's a little scattered because it just came up. Um, but does that kind of make sense? And is there anything that people want to kind of speak to, you know, on tone policing and maybe differentiating between choosing to be an ally and advocate and not? You can just unmute yourself and go ahead because <laughs> you don't have a... <laughs> I don't mean to monopolize, but I waited. Nobody else is unmuting. <laughs> but I think this is a very important topic, especially for um, Black and Indigenous people. Um, and I think that's because there's a whole level of intergenerational trauma and epigenetics that go around the way we're supposed to speak and talk and be. And so when we are tired and fatigued or when we just don't want to have to answer a loaded question because we're on our lunch break and only have five minutes left and we're trying to rush it, it lends itself to feeling like our allies are feeling attacked or dismissed or ignored or that we're true and that we're stupid when we're not. We should be able to be passionate, articulate, angry. We should be able to be angry by Bog without it being about pacifying those who are learning and are allies. 
there should not be the term the angry black woman, <laughs> right? Or the drunk Indian, right? There should not be a, a, all these viewpoints that make when we take a stand, it be negative and bad and dangerous. And, and, and I think one of the things our allies need to realize that if we are speaking passionately, if we are raising our voice, if we are heated, it doesn't mean that we're angry. It means that we've had hundreds and hundreds of years of these questions being slammed at us and then dismissed. And that now is the time for us to speak those words and have you sit back and listen without taking it like we are talking oppressively or over you. I think one of the greatest, most subtle forms of racism is tone policing. Because they're now not only telling us what we should say, but they're telling us how we should say it. And they're infantilizing us and saying, we cannot control our emotions and ourselves. Therefore, what we are saying is rendered moot. Um, if no one else wants to go, I, I don't know, there's no uh, order for this. Um, I was not all that popular in high school because I was not a fan of racist jokes. And I did not think that those jokes and comments were acceptable. And I would say something about it if they were said. Um, like I said before, particularly just being Mexican and Trump and everything that, that happened. I was in ninth grade at the time when that was all going on. And I heard a lot of things and I heard a lot of things. And sometimes people didn't realize that I was Mexican. So they would say it around me. Um, sometimes people did and they would purposely make those jokes towards me. And it was treated like it was acceptable. And when I was angry or offended or told them that it was not okay, I was a buzzkill and I was no fun um, without realizing that those things, while they may be jokes, they're not appropriate and they perpetuate things that are very, very dangerous. Um, there's also a rise in Latino hate crime and it's, we've seen many um, Latinos, again, particularly a lot of the attention is coming out of the United States because there's a bigger population there, um, of people being attacked and people being assaulted. Um, and that's not okay and those jokes are not okay and they may seem like they're not a big deal, but they are, they perpetuate that idea that that's okay and that that's an acceptable way to think and that those stereotypes are okay. Um, yeah, and that you're not allowed to be angry. You're not allowed to be mad about it. You should be mad about it. These things aren't okay. And you're allowed to be mad when people are being hurt and when people are being mistreated. And really the bigger question should be why other people aren't angry. And as for white people, um, you, you need to check your fragility a little bit and you need to take that in a bit of like, okay, that goes on the back burner right now because that's not what import, what's important, you know, um, the lives of people of color are far more important than you being offended. And if you need to feel offended for a little bit because you're being told something you need to hear and you're having to wake up to something that's very real, then you can be offended for a little bit. And I try to tell that to other white people because if you, know, if you need to be offended for a little bit, that's fine. And that's not nearly as damaging as everything else, so. I think it's okay. And as a white person too, having to check myself in that a little bit and understand that, you know, sometimes you may realize that what you're doing is wrong and you just need to own up to that and it can hurt for a little bit, but that's better. It's better than the alternative. And I think an important point, the jokes is a really important thing is because our world normalizes uncomfortable things through jokes. That's how we kind of can like, Humor is one of the greatest healing tools that there is. And it's one of the greatest ways to connect people. But humor also normalizes things. So when you have racist jokes, like the ones that you're talking about, it then makes the racist ideology normal. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly my point. And people then become comfortable with everything else, thinking that they can make a joke out of it. and oh, it's not okay and it makes everything else worse. And it's just, it's that first stepping stone on the giant pyramid of racism that, you know, people think, well, maybe, you know, I'm not enslaving people. I'm not hurting people. I'm not killing people. Yeah, well, you're making jokes and you're that little 
that first little brick on the pyramid. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you so much. Um, so the next uh, and actually our last kind of um, pre-planned question here. Um, so one of our now, like now with all of this new, you know, uh, momentum and research and reading and just how much more accessible things are, the conversation has turned away from this on this idea of tolerance, like we're just tolerating, you know, that's not enough anymore. And we're starting to have a discussion about anti racism. So, you know, it's not enough to just not perpetuate overt racism. It's not enough just to tolerate. We actually have to take steps towards dismantling, towards being actively anti racist. Um, and, you know, that's tough. Those are hard things. And there's a lot of unpacking that we need to do as individuals. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of work uh, on an individual and a system level, right? So um, what are some things you'd like to see from your community in terms of anti-racism work? Um, and what are some things that allies can start doing to make formative change? So, you know, we talked about the idea of education, educating ourselves, um, but what are some more formative things people can start doing in their journey uh, to make meaningful change? And what would you like to see from your community? Um, well, as I, as I said before, you know, I'm a, I'm a recent graduate out of school. So a lot of my experiences came from school and racism in schools with kids and kids who a lot of the time don't have filters and maybe don't realize that the things that they're saying are wrong. And I experienced um, racist things in school. And I think one of the biggest things that needs to be made, um, obviously, because kids are the ones who are going to grow up to be adults and grow up to um, be in all those institutions and everything that we're trying to change. And I think schools need to make sure that racist comments, racist jokes, racist actions in schools need to be treated as unacceptable as everything else. Um, I had a boy in school once um, during some kind of altercation um, come back at me with, well, shut up and jump back across the border where you came from as a reply to me. And it was never really even addressed. Um, in my shock, I was only able to kind of stutter out. You can't say that to me. Like, you're not allowed to say that to me here. And all that ever happened was the teacher, first of all, no one in the class said a thing, not a single word. Um, and she took him out of class. And when I asked her about it afterwards, she didn't even ask him what he had said. She didn't, he didn't have to apologize. Nothing ever happened. It was completely disregarded. And every single person that I told about it completely disregarded it as a schoolyard comment. Um, and I saw that happen time and time again with other kids and other people of different races and whatever who were, um, who people were racist to. And it was brushed off as any other you know, kids disagreement. And I think we need to see in schools that that's not acceptable. And probably even throughout the rest of the community that that's not acceptable behavior and that there will be punishment and something that happens to people who perpetuate that kind of behavior. Um, I think that would be really important. And also maybe adding, we get so used to this rhetoric that we're all the same and that's why racism should stop. And I think we need to realize that that's, not true. We're all different. We have different experiences. We look different. Our families, our cultures, everything is different and that's okay. And that is still a reason that we are all deserving of the same rights, that we don't have to be the same, that you don't have to relate to somebody in order for them to be deserving of the rights that everyone else is, you know, that they can speak a different language, have a different religion, look different and still be worthy of all of the same rights in every aspect that you are and that they don't have to conform to the white normative of society in order to get those rights. Um, <clears throat> there is a book by How to Be, called How to Be Anti-Racism by Ibram Kennedy. 
or Kendi, Kendi, excuse me. Um, and in there, it says, there is no neutrality in the racism struggle. Essentially saying that the opposite of racism is not, not racist. You have to be actively anti-racist. Racist. And I think quite often people um, think that, oh, well, well, I don't have any strong feelings either way. But standing back and, and seeing it happen, you are essentially accepting it as being okay. Um, you're saying that that behavior is okay. So it's something that I think uh, it is, there are conversations around what can we do um, in terms of our organization. Uh, some of the things that we've done is we have a youth crew, crew um, and it's entirely led by them. We don't give them any direction. And it's one of our programs that are welcoming to all youth. And they really define for themselves what is diversity and they tackle on, take on things that are important to them and their peers. And um, one of the things they did was uh, they saw the increase of graffiti and they started to, they created a portal where people can report and say, what type of graffiti is it? Is it gender-based? Is it racial-based? Um, and now they're hoping to go to the municipalities and ask, okay, we have this information, what can we now do? And this is our youth. Our youth were the ones that um, encourage us to pick up the camera. I mentioned earlier, we had no experience, no idea what um, the different parts of this camera was or, or the thing that you put on the microphone to muffle all that loud noise. Um, but again, it was them first suggesting it and saying, hey, why don't we try this? Um, so it, it's really powerful having those ideas from them and actually doing something about it. Um, one of the things I think Sagun can probably speak to is we have something that's called the Respect Network. We are starting to really, um, it's just been revitalized. Uh, it is not just organizations any longer. We have residents that are on this panel at this network really speaking out and saying, okay, this is where I think we need to do. This is the conversation that we need in my community. Um, we have, we also host what we call the Local Immigration Partnership, um, where we work with, right now they're piloting a program where they're working with employers on inclusion. And it's not just for immigrants, they're really looking at it um, in terms of accessibility, in terms of policies that they have um, across for all diverse populations, and, and looking at it for from the business end. Um, but when uh, Sylvia, you, you had mentioned about the schools, that also really resonates with me. Um, I think for children particularly, they, they don't recognize racism. They don't know what it is. So when it happens, you internalize it. You think, oh, this is something wrong with me. So we can't wait for that data, so to say, to say, oh, okay, we need to do something. We know it exists. We know it is happening there. We are hearing the stories. So it's time for us to take a look and see, okay, well, what can we do? And, and when you said that, it really brought to mind my being, I'm a child here, and I remember because I am Asian, if I didn't fit that stereotype of being the submissive Asian girl, then you were called a coconut, or my friend was called a banana because I was standing up for something and being more aggressive. Um, I remember being afraid to bring my own food to school because people would bully me for having food that smelled funny or bringing a spoon and fork to eat with, so much so that I would beg my mom to to give me sandwiches. And when she finally gave me sandwiches, realizing I didn't like sandwiches, 
and then hiding it because I didn't want her to feel bad that I had begged her for these sandwiches. <laughs> so I think um, children in particular are really, they are vulnerable because they don't realize um, that it isn't them, that it's the systems around them and that it is learned and it has to happen earlier because I never imagined having to speak with my little girl at three years old and have so many conversations since then about race, about color. So I think schools, like you said, is, is a very important part of this conversation as well. And it's so many different areas where we, we need to be having these conversations and critically looking at what we can do and what is within our control to influence. So like, just like Cherry uh, touched upon uh, respect network. So our organization is uh, working um, as a South Okanagan Silicon Respect Network, uh, which is a part of the Thompson Okanagan Respect Network, a network of community organizations organized against racism and hate crime. So this um, network uh, has been in place for quite some long uh, quite some time and uh, um, it is a part of the provincial strategy uh, through Reliant, uh, resilience bc support anti-racism initiatives um, the local networks develop a coordinated process of responding towards uh, you know, acts of racism or hate crime as um, as well as organized educational events and projects to raise public awareness about the issues and uh, celebrate diversity in the community. So the main mission of this uh, respect network is to promote inclusive communities by readdressing racism, hate crimes, and um, generating an awareness through education. Uh, so currently, the Respect Network has about 30 members, and like Cherry said, they're not just organizations, they are citizens of the community who are participants of this Respect Network. Uh, there are about 20 organizations participating for uh, this cause. Uh, the main uh, focus uh, of forming this Respect Network was to form a community protocol which is a living document uh, to respond to incidents of racism and crime, hate crime by providing support and resources to individuals um, who are experiencing racism. Uh, the other thing that we took up, uh, like Cherry said, we started an anti-racism survey or mapping uh, in the start of January, uh, which we closed uh, in March. That was basically to collate data, to collect data, to back that uh, racism does exist in our community. And it's not something that is just happening in bigger, you know, cities. It does happen in the Okanagan. So we have the data now. We are working on that data and uh, trying to visualize it and analyze it to uh, form uh, uh, an awareness or a public uh, awareness campaign that can educate the society on how we can stand uh, up and be allies against fighting this racism and hate. Uh, the other thing that we did was um, we are working on forming a reporting portal with uh, in collaboration with um, Kelowna Community Resources and UBC. So this would uh, not only uh, gather data or gather information about somebody who is a victim of hate crimes. It can be somebody who's just witnessed it. And this is uh, something that will carry on to gather data and information and for us to formulate uh, a protocol or uh, camp, you know, make uh, formulate campaigns on how to fight racism and how to educate people on responding to any kind of crime. This is an ongoing process, and uh, we will keep that on um, sites, and we'll share with uh, you all. And if I can just add on to what Sugun said about the reporting portal, I think this is really critical because the province is also providing um, a reporting portal for a province-wide uh, option. But I think what's important about it is we're giving people options. 
to reach out and seek help because we've recognized here, um, police, how do you go to them if it's coming from these institutions, right? So we're hoping to provide alternatives, different ways, different ways to reach out, um, get supports. So for me, in terms of what I would like to see um, with anti-racism within the community and also with allies is, I think people need to understand that we are within a structure and a system that is colonial. It is based off of white Eurocentric standards. And so pretty much everything that we interact with is based off of that. One thing I think that is very important for people to do, uh, not just white allies, but people within the communities to educate or to re-educate ourselves on a lot of these issues um, because the things that we were taught in school are often woefully lacking in the reality that um, people have faced. The things that we see in the news concerning other communities are often tinted in a way to alleviate guilt and alleviate fragility and you're not getting the whole story. Um, in terms of just indigenous people, one thing I would encourage allies um, and other uh, BIPOC people to do is to read the Indian Act um, in its entirety. It's very hard to stomach. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough thing that uh, you know we're still dealing with the repercussions of. And another thing that is great to read is the uh, National Inquiries Report on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Um, these are all things that uh, affect our lives daily. And we're a part of this country. Um, you know, it's, it's important to educate yourselves and it has been touched upon before, but I'm going to double down on it because I think it is so important for people to understand. But while it is great to reach out to people of color and ask for our opinions and our thoughts, please, the onus on educating yourself is on you. Do not rely on um, taking that energy from BIPOC people to educate you for free. Um, there is a multitude of resources out there that are extremely easy to access. Um, the two things I just mentioned are great ones. If you want to educate yourself more on indigenous rights um, and the state of indigenous affairs in this country, um, just take it upon yourself. And after you've educated yourself, if you wanna have a conversation I'm sure many of us would be happy to have it, but just remember it is your responsibility to take that upon yourself. Jennifer, did you wanna say anything? Sorry, I didn't realize it was my turn. I most certainly do. <laughs> Couple things, um, and it, it, to add to what everybody, the wonderful things everybody else said, and a couple of my own thoughts as well, is we know that children by the age of 18 months recognize race, literally. Their brains define in racial ways because there are racial features of everybody being different and unique. And so I think we need to start the education at the preschool level. We have little kids learning everything now at three years old in their daycares. And I think we need to put programs in place in every single daycare that fosters racial awareness, diversity and inclusivity. So that the messages they may or may not be getting at home are challenged at such an early age. So I think that's one thing that I think we really need to do. And in terms of educating, I think We've got a lot of things that we can do. Um, CBC Gem, and I'm not a commercial, I'm sorry, <laughs> but they have some really great short documentaries on BIPOC issues, and they split it. They, they have on Black issues, on Indigenous issues. They have the complete erasure of our traditions and our people and the histories, and those are really great ways for you and the public to be able to just get a little taste of what's going on if you're not comfortable diving into a big book or into the whole act because it's just too overwhelming and you're not gonna do it. 
they have excellent, they, some of them as short as nine minutes long. And so they've got a lot of good resources there. I think in terms of, of, of what people can do uh, to really foster anti-Black racism is to start being more performative. And ways in which they can do that is encouraging BIPOC businesses and communities to have a voice and say, we don't have a Black Chamber of Commerce, an Indigenous Chamber of Commerce chapter, a BIPOC Chamber of Commerce chapter. How many of our organizations actually have lists of BIPOC businesses in Penticton and the community? I think all those things will help create a space where you can see that not only are we here, are we successful, are we responsible, but we're educated and we're powerful. And I think that's really lacking. Um, I don't know, I don't know where a person, if they wanted to know where BIPOC businesses were, where they could go to, an organization they go to, they hand them a list. Why didn't every single organization have that list? I think that'd be a really important thing to start. And that list can be a little dated, we all do, you know, the, there's a lot of lists I have in my center, a little bit dated, but then you update them whenever you can. And you add links to these people's websites. You actually start fostering, building connections with BIPOC people in the community in a way that, that demonstrates that they're not the James Gang on the corner, that they're not angry, destitute, horrible, but they're successful, smart, powerful. And I think it's really important for us to look at that. And I think schools have to start having mandatory courses on BIPOC, like year long courses on anti-Black racism, on anti-Indigenous racism. There is more education now coming out on Indigenous issues in Canada. A lot of it is a little surface, but it's a start. There's hardly anything on Black um, issues in Canada. We don't even know, the people don't even know the vibrant, um, the vibrant community that was a Black community in the 30s, 40s, and 50s here in, in BC. You know, and I think that if we don't know that we exist and we don't have that sense of pride and people don't know that it happens, then we can't, we can't move past this, this idea that we are othered. And I think BIPOC are so often othered. And I think education at a very young age and then education at, at elementary school age and then education at high school age and not make them electives. It's interesting because teachers actually she can choose a couple of the electives, like what are they gonna teach in history, right? And they're teaching more indigenous stuff in history, which is fabulous, but it should be mandatory. And black history should be mandatory and POC history should be mandatory. There should be modules on all of the history of who we are as Canadians, so that we're not seen as a white nation that accepts other people in. Rather, we're seen as a colonized nation that's willing to work and grow and change and become a strong, multicultural, diverse country, which I really believe we can do if we dig our hands in the dirt and work through the muck and make it work. And I think that we also need to put a focus. It could be a monthly focus on Black businesses. Most people don't even know that they're there. Indigenous businesses, most people don't even know that they're there. BIPOC businesses, most people don't even know they're there. Farmers, there's now this stereotype of what these BIPOC businesses are going to be. Farmers, right? You know, restaurant owners, the Greek community, right? You know, instead, why not actually have a real idea of what's going on in our community and teach people that we are here and that we are successful and that we pay taxes and that we help the community and that we volunteer and that we have a voice. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I think that those are all some really strong points. Um, and again, some great material here for allies uh, to start, start their own journey. Um, so I really appreciate the time and energy and effort and labor that you've all put into this. Um, I think it's a great resource. This panel in itself is, is awesome for folks to be able to really start taking steps towards a better tomorrow. 
Um, so we're kind of coming to the end of our two hours, which seems unbelievable. Um, it's gone by so quick and I'm, I'm so happy that I got to be a part of this and listen to all of you. Um, I don't have any more questions and I've been watching the Facebook page. It doesn't look like anybody's asking questions at this point, um, which is no problem. I thought before we leave, I would just leave the floor open in case anybody uh, had anything else to say that maybe wasn't addressed. Um, obviously, we can't address everything <laughs> in one two hour panel, but if there's something really pointing out um, that you feel like you'd like to say or share, this would be a fantastic opportunity. Um, and if not, no worries as well. So again, you can just, there's no structure for this, so you can just unmute yourself if you want to do so. Um, otherwise, no problem. Um, I just want to say that I think one really good resource, um, I think the best way to educate yourself is educate yourself from people in the community who are speaking um, on their own issues. Um, I think that's the clearest lens. Um, but again, not everybody is your free teacher. So there are so many people of color in every community online who are willing to share on YouTube, Instagram, whatever people are sharing there and they are up and is a good way to not bombard the people who are close to you with questions that were unwanted and um, still get the information from the hands of people who are living in different communities and from all around the world as well. Um, you get lots of different perspectives. So definitely go online and um, find the people who want to share and educate you and listen to them first because that's the best way to do it. I think I would just also say that BIPOC people are tired. We're all very tired and our allies are tired. And I just want to put forth an acknowledgement of how tired our allies are and that don't give up. Don't stop because the next crisis, the next issue, the next, next Facebook post comes and that's what we disappear into the internet and we just become a little blip. Let's take this to truly make change in our country so that we can be the diverse, amazing country that Canada can be. Don't stop. Okay, so if that's it, um, I'll say thank you again so much. Um, it's been a pleasure this afternoon spending time with you and listening to all of you. Um, so just some closing notes. Uh, I'd like to just thank again the BC Arts Council and the province of BC and the city of Penticton for sponsoring this event um, and the exhibition Living While Marginalized. The exhibition is taking place at the Penticton Art Gallery until May 15th. That's our last day. Um, I'm a little bit sad we can't have a big closing ceremony because of restrictions, but I'm equally as happy that the gallery is open for folks to walk around and view so you can see it in person. If you're joining us from out of town or you're just simply unable to attend the gallery in person, I'll say again, we've got the live stream of the gallery, close-ups of all of the pieces of works um, on the Penticton Art Gallery's website as well as their Instagram. So please take some time and just go ahead, take a look um, at the exhibition. I'd like to thank uh, SOEX today as well for partnering us with us on this uh, panel and for sharing your expertise and all of your beautiful ideas and concepts and programs. I've learned a lot today already. Um, and I'm also going to put together uh, just a little email to send out of the things that people suggested and recommended and we'll post it on social media as well because um, we've covered a lot. So uh, I, I put some, some of the books and links and stuff like that together so we can send out. So if there's nothing else, I would just say thank you. I hope you have a lovely afternoon and I think it's still kind of sunny out there. So hopefully you can get some time outside. <laughs> and until next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Keisha. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Keisha. It was a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye everyone. Thank you for tuning in.